The next big event was Srila Prabhupada giving the Sunday Feast Lecture. Now, Prabhupada had always given the morning classes. That's something amazing about Prabhupada. Wherever he was, that's how most of the devotees who joined after the GBC was formed in 1972 or 3. Most devotees didn't speak to Prabhupada directly. They heard Prabhupada through class. But this class, he opened up the floor for questions and answers at the end. This was a Sunday feast lecture. Um, some Christians in the audience uh, raised their hand and Prabhupada had to batter back and forth with them about, you know, how Jesus Christ said, "There's no, <laughs> thou shalt not kill, why do you kill, you know, because they're trying to say Jesus is the only way and Prabhupada was saying, well, then be a good Christian and be vegetarian because you shouldn't kill animals. And, in the name of Christ, and then uh, I had a question because I knew that Prabhupada didn't do questions that often, you know, because devotees would ask questions. I don't know what happened, but he was generally he would just say thank you very much at the end of the lecture. So I just threw my hand up, said Shri the Prabhupada, and uh, he looked at me, and and then I thought, oh my God, I have to have a question. I just knew that it was a great chance to ask one. So I just blurted out the first thing that came to the top of my head. Sri the Prabhupada, how can I perfect my devotional service? And he thought for a moment, he said, just chant Hare Krishna and everything else will come. It's very simple. And at the time I thought, that's kind of a stupid question because I didn't really think it out. And the answer he gave me is just what he tells everybody, just chant Hare Krishna, he says that all the time. But as the years have gone by, I realized that it was a good question and that it was a perfect answer. And that the, it was very, very important actually in my life to understand that, to always keep on chanting Hare Krishna no matter what ups and downs you have, or whatever happens, everything else will come. It was actually a very deep philosophical point that he made and that it's very simple. So that was Srila Prabhupada in Atlanta, 1975. So every day Srila Prabhupada gave class and in the morning. And Srila Prabhupada, I remember little bits and pieces from the classes. Uh, one was about how he said that we were all in the womb at one time. If we were in advance, then we had a vision of Krishna and that we promised Krishna that once we get out of this horrible situation, we're going to surrender our lives. But then, he's, then you're born and then there's a, a forgetfulness because everybody's all, all giving you attention and, you know, nice facility, you know, so the, that you forget your promise that you, you're going to go give yourself, you know, now it's nice, you, know, you forget the misery. So Prabhupada was pointing out how the you know, when they're in a miserable condition in the material world, it can be good for our spiritual life, not always enjoying all the time. And then he said uh, about parenthood, he said if the father is not responsible, then he should be kicked. And I thought that was a pretty heavy thing to say, you know, that he was trying to sh point out that the parent, being a father is, you know, he would always say that it's best if you stay brahmachari, but then he said if you do get married, then you can't be all halfway about that. You have to be a very responsible father and be ready to take your, not only take your kids back to Godhead through spiritual life, but also take care of them, all their, all their needs in life. After the class, Prabhupada came around, went to the front of the building to get picked up and go to the hotel. And I went around the back. And I buzzed around in a circle and then a, <laughs> We were out in front of the temple and the car wasn't there. The devotee, who was, whoever was supposed to pick Prabhupada up, got caught in traffic, in Chicago traffic, you can imagine. So he was stuck somewhere. And this, we didn't have cell phones, so nobody knew where he was. So it was July and it was, it was uh, you know, nine o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, uh, the whole operation comes to a halt because the car's not there to pick up Prabhupada. So, Tamal Krishna Goswami's standing there, and he had nothing to do with 
any of these arrangements. First of all, he wasn't the temple president, the GBC, or neither was it his job to arrange for the car. But guess who Srila Prabhupada go, goes to? It's Tamal Krishna Goswami. So then I could see that Prabhupada seemed to hold him responsible for everything. <laughs> and Prabhupada looked at Goswami and said, so, where's the car? And Tamal Krishna Maharaj immediately goes into action. He, he sent somebody to get a van from the back, and then he, they went running back there in Janardhan, and then they said that, oh, well, the, the, the bus has got the van blocked in, so then he sent Dravanaksha to move the bus so that Janardhan could bring the van around. And this is like, this got into me like 20, 25 minutes. It wasn't, it was getting hot. And Prabhupada was also, but Prabhupada actually was, I, I've seen pictures of this incident because I, I got to be in picture of Prabhupada because of this on page 178, 1996, Vyasa Puja. There's a photo of this incident and Prabhupada would look very transcendental. He, he was a little disturbed, but he just seemed to go into his chanting and the devotees were trying to protect him from the sun, so they put a, a chutter, a Harinam chutter, and built it like a little tent, you know, or, or like a pot bill over his head. And then finally the, the driver of the car pulls up, and you could tell on his face that he knew he was really late. And this, the, every, but Prabhupada wasn't too disturbed, you know. He, he was disturbed enough to say, where's the car? But then he just got in and went, went away. A couple things I learned with Srila Prabhupada on the thing with the car in Chicago was that he gets upset about something, but he doesn't hold it. He was always transcendental and absorbed in Krishna's holy names and, and his mission. And he just briefly got upset. Obviously, you know, the car's not there. It's a total space out. And then the other thing was how he put the whole thing on Tamal Krishna Goswami. And I just learned some more about how Prabhupada expected Tamal Krishna Maharaj to carry the ball all the time, you know, that he was, Prabhupada expected him to, he was right-hand man, and that needed to be done, and whatever, it, and he, he was responsible. So in Mayapur, 1976, uh, I went on the morning walk here uh, along the front wall and there is through an exhibit of ISKCON projects all over the world. Uh, I wasn't uh, supposed to go on the morning walk. Of course, everybody was, had to be a GBC or a sannyasi, so I really wanted to get on, so I pulled a chutter over my head and uh, slid into this walk. There's a picture of this in Mahamaya's book uh, called Srila Prabhupada is Coming. The caption says Mayapur 1975, but it was actually 1976. Not just because I'm in it, but Pusta Krishna Swami is the, the secretary, Rameshwar is a sannyasi, obviously 1976. One thing I, the first thing I noticed about the morning walk was how polite everybody was. Srila Prabhupada created an aura, an atmosphere on the morning walk where everybody grew up and was extremely in the mode of goodness. And this was really noticeable because these, these the, we were all young devotees and quite often kind of pushy. But with Sh in Srila Prabhupada's presence, there was complete calm, which is so noticeable. It was like, as, like they say, as thick as soup. You know, it was like uh, a, a magic uh, f f shield of, of of sattvic energy that, that emanated from Srila Prabhupada. So I could tell that when Prabhupada's there, then he, everybody's consciousness comes up. And when he would stop, and, you know, even though we were all trying to listen, and there was like tw 20 or five devotees, he would stop, everybody would stop. It wouldn't be, you know, like Keystone cops all fumbling over each other. Prabhupada would go, and then everybody would go. And there was no, there was no uh, tension or pushing or shoving in this. So that was really noticeable. And we went along the, through these exhibits, and they had, you know, this is really elaborate now. Forty years later, I, I, the international exhibits have really come a long way. But the idea was there. And they had bamboo walls, 
and they had pictures of temples from all over the world, of deities, farm projects, what devotees are doing, you know, with captions like here's New Vrindavan in the USA and it shows the cows and the deities and here's uh, Gita Nagari and then it show book distribution and show the warehouse in LA and the books and the BBT offices and a lot of nice things. Everything was really nice. But what Srila Prabhupada really liked, the thing that I could see that this is something that meant more to him than anything, just by the way he reacted to it, was the quotes about his books from scholars. And Srila Prabhupada liked everything. All these different pictures of temples all over the world and projects. But he stopped the whole show when he got to the quotes about his books from university professors. And he had them read right there on the spot. And he stopped the whole morning walk for this. And then he said that these should be sent to Indira Gandhi. And then I heard somebody say, yeah, this is a big thing. And Prabhupada was really appreciative of those. And I think that's really stuck out on that morning walk. Another very significant day was the Tamal Krishna Goswami being uh, sent to China. Uh, we consider that very significant because there's now a thousand devotees in China. We have about a hundred of them here that came for Gaur Purnima. But at the time, it was just like as if he was being banished. And uh, we didn't, you know, the Radhadamadar party had built up very successfully. And a lot of devotees were from temples that wanted to be with the sannyasis and they left their temples that were run by grihastras and those grihastras band together and came to complain to Srila Prabhupada, you know, we've, they've lost all these men to the Radhadamadar party. And Prabhupada, he really loved the Radhadamadar party and he could have said, well, to, I, I, I'm happy that they're there because he was. You know, and they're doing great work, and I, he could have stuck up for Tamal Krishna Goswami. He said, you know, he's, don't leave him alone, he's, he's, but Prabhupada was very intuitive, and he understood that these devotees who were complaining had to be pacified. Prabhupada had to take their side because they would not have been able to handle it if he hadn't, and Tamal Krishna Maharaj was ready to do anything Prabhupada would tell him to do. He was fully surrendered. So Srila Prabhupada uh, called Goswami into the room and there was the conversation and Prabhupada said, uh, so what are we going to do with you, you know? And Tamal Krishnamara said, well, Prabhupada, maybe I should just go to China. And Prabhupada said, yes, <laughs> Krishna is speaking through you. And there was the whole exchange where Goswamis tried to get out of it, you know, well, Prabhupada, I can't, I was just joking, I, you know, and Prabhupada said, this is no joke, you're going to China, and uh, Guru Kripa said, well, Prabhupada, I'll, I'll go, and then Prabhupada said, no, he must go, and Prabhupada just wouldn't take no for an answer, and then uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj relented, and then uh, we got, uh, so that was, that was right after Mangal Arti. So then Prabhupada packed it up and went out in the morning walk. And Hari Sari was Prabhupada's secretary, you know, and he would help Prabhupada, you know, the, the one motion thing of handing him this, his cane and his, and his uh, bead bag and as Prabhupada went out the door and then had to have the tape recorder. And we went up to the Lotus Building onto the roof. Pancharatna was there trying to stop people like me from getting on. And so I, huddled in between Madhavisha and Keshava and I slipped in on this walk. And we got up onto the roof of the Lotus Building and Prabhupada turned around and was walking backwards. And he faced the sannyasi and GBC men and he raised his, put his hands out like this. He had his uh, cane and his beads and he said, you'll all be happy to know Tamal is going to China. And there was kind of a muffled uh, jai because it was sort of like the, the clap at a golf course in, in a tournament. It was very, it was like, uh, we didn't really want that to happen, you know, because it sounded like exile. It, we had no idea that it was going to turn into him actually being able to do this. But it showed us that Prabhupada really cared 
about that part of the world. That's what I learned from that. That Prabhupada under you know Prabhupada knew that China has to be um, included in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and it's going to take Tamal Krishna Goswami to make that happen. And he finally did. So that was the lesson I got from that. Prabhupada wanted because this point Prabhupada himself had gone to Russia and the rest of the world, Africa, and Australia, and America, North and South. So then China was still untapped, you know. So that, that was Prabhupada sending the Goswami to China. I'd like to say a little more about Mayapur, 1976. Just uh, one thing Prabhupada said on the, mor on the morning walk that showed how much he cared about Mayapur was, uh, he said we should close down everything we're doing all over the world and just bring all the devotees here to Mayapur and develop this place. He'd have been already talking about the, te the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, and now he made this extraordinary statement. So <laughs> Rameshwar Swami said, But Prabhupada, we have so many preaching programs going on all over the world. And Prabhupada said, we'll preach to people here. We'll bring them, people will come from all over and to Mayapur, and, and when they get here, then we'll preach to them. And then he pointed out to over here where this uh, kind of a field out by the Jalangi behind the Goshal area, and he said, we'll build an airport, and people will come from all over the world. I, uh, I wanted to have that confirmed, so I, I confronted Rameshwar just about a month ago when he was here in Mayapur. I said, do you remember when Prabhupada said that we, everything should be brought here to Mayapur, and you said, you know, we have all these other preaching programs, and, and I, I got him to admit it. He goes, yes, Prabhupada did say that, something like that, but he didn't really mean to close down everything. He, so we, we agreed that he was just trying to show the importance of Mayapur. Uh, that, that was what I learned from that. That Prabhupada, Mayapur meant very, very much to Srila Prabhupada. One time he told Giriraj Swami that book distribution in Mayapur are my most important projects. I was cooking and I made these para. Para is a burfi where you cook it down until it becomes like a cookie. And I was making all the milk sweets for Radha Govinda, trained by Bhaktivinod Prabhu. And this, the servant came down and said, Prabhupada said that the tell the cook that the para was very good. So that really touched my heart, you know. Prabhupada, he was so personal. I realized how personal Srila Prabhupada was. He was thinking about that somebody's cooking these milk sweets and that they should know that they did something right. And he told the, the secretary to tell me, you know, that's how personal Prabhupada was. There was everything going on, but he was able to appreciate a little milk sweet sitting on his breakfast plate along with everything else. He really paid attention to detail. And then we had a, a darshan with uh, Irmala and her husband and the baby and her father. Now Irmala wasn't real happy that a bunch of devotees were allowed in the room, but I was really happy that we got to go to this darshan because it was so nice to be with Sri Prabhupada up there on the 11th floor of the, of the skyscraper building. And, on 55th Street. And Srila Prabhupada, he's, he was saying how uh, people are afraid of death, you know, so then they, they go, uh, why, why, he said, why, if we're not afraid to die, why do we fly? So why do we run away when, there, when there's danger? If there's a, the building's on fire, why, why do they avoid a building and then call the fire department? Then Prabhupada made the noise of, wah, 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 you know, about <laughs> the sound of the fire engine going by. And he said that there's always, these, these vehicles are always making this, the noise, you know, from the sirens, so emergency vehicles. So Prabhupada was, I learned that Prabhupada was trying to show that we are definitely afraid of death. Why do we always try to avoid it all? If anybody says we're not afraid of death, they're not really being honest. Prabhupada knew that, yeah, everybody is afraid of death. Nobody wants that. So then, unless you're suicidal, you know, but that's only 
that's because you're afraid of living. But that doesn't mean that you're not afraid. You're, you're, everyone's afraid, you know. So there was a nice discussion with the father. The father, he said to Srila Prabhupada, uh, it was also nice how Pra I learned that Prabhupada liked devotees' parents to be, feel comfortable. He, he would uh, reach out, you know, to, he knew that he had so many, all these the kids became his kids. <laughs> and he was trying to show that Prabhupada was the father, but it, he, was, he was also very appreciative of anybody who brought their parents, you know. So Irmala's father said to Prabhupada, I can't relate to serving God. I can only relate to serving humanity. So Srila Prabhupada said, when you serve God, then you, then you can serve humanity. He said, if you love God, you can love everyone else. And he used the example of a pond. He said, if you throw rocks in the middle of the pond, then the little rivulets, they expand outward more and more. But there's no conflict. As long as the rocks are in the center of the pond. He said, if there's different interests, then there's always conflict if you have stones dropping, he used the word stone, if you have stones dropping in different places. He said, but as long as they're in the center, then as long as you put your love to Krishna, love to God in the center, then it expands evenly until again it reaches the lotus feet of God. Thank you.